looking to our session uh, for C6 Watershed Scale Flood Management um, Initiatives. And our first speaker um, presentation today is going to be John Sim. And um, the presentation name is International Guidelines for Use of Natural and Based Features Supporting a New Age of Flood Management. And if you have any questions at any time, just go ahead and type um, in the right hand side um, and we will address those Q&As after the presentation is complete. Enjoy. Good afternoon from the United Kingdom. My name is Jonathan Sim of HR Wallingford and I'm making this presentation on behalf of what is actually quite a large team of people who've been involved in these international guidelines on natural and nature-based features. Uh, particularly I want to mention Dr Todd Bridges from the Army Corps of Engineers. So this presentation is really just a very brief overview of what we're hoping to make available to you by the end of this year. So what are natural and nature based features? Uh, they're essentially landscape features that are developed to provide engineering functions relevant to flood risk management whilst still producing additional economic, environmental and social benefits. And this definition is more or less been enshrined in US law, US federal law under the WIN Act, where the terms natural feature and nature based feature have been defined. And more than that, there's been a requirement for federal projects for natural and nature based features to be prioritized for consideration in uh, federal projects for flood risk management, hurricane and storm damage reduction and ecosystem restoration. So why should we adopt uh, NNBF, natural and nature based features? Obviously, we're looking to achieve direct flood risk reduction benefits. But there's lots of potential for multiple co-benefits, adaptable solutions, <clears throat> and they have the capacity to augment conventional defences, uh, reducing the requirements for hard materials and extending the life of those uh, conventional measures. And of course, not everything is new uh, because there's actually quite a legacy, for example, in the coastal environment of using beaches, uh, a recognition in the middle of the last century of the importance of marshes, mangroves and dunes, and the progressive move from hard to soft engineering from the 1980s. Fluvial side of things, um, of course, in the context of ASFPM, we go back to Gilbert White, but a, a lot of even earlier developments of that driven by recreational river restoration, uh, the river restoration movement. But the point is that now we're trying to more explicitly aim to use NMVF for flood risk management. Of course, there's a lot of existing guidance out there, um, but some of it's rather uh, short uh, and fragmentary. And the vision for the guidance that we're now preparing is something much more comprehensive. In the US context, it falls under the engineering with nature umbrella. And already last year, uh, an atlas of examples of natural nature based features was produced and launched in January. So we're now uh, complementing that uh, set of examples with um, more specific guidance. The project is a multi author effort with government, academia, NGOs, engineering firms, construction companies. A list of the icons of those involved are here on this slide. We're attempting to address the whole of the project life cycle 
and the document has more or less ended up in three main parts overarching considerations and then a section for coastal applications and measures and a section for fluvial applications and measures what i'm now going to do is essentially run through the main chapters more or less one slide per chapter uh, to give you this overview of what might you might expect to find in the document when it's released so first of all we developed a framework um, for the the process that you should go through in considering the implementation of natural nature based features so the the, the process framework is largely similar to that for almost any engineering project but underpinning it are a series of key principles uh, firstly the idea of systems based portfolio thinking so not just looking at things in uh, measures in isolation the importance of multidisciplinary working which is the only way you're going to achieve sustainable uh, solutions with those multiple co-benefits that we're looking for um, the need to embrace risk and uncertainty in solution performance from the outset and that goes along with the next principle which is that of adaptive management so you're actively anticipating and embracing change in that regard and there is this need for longer term commitment to maintenance and management uh, there's not possible in this context to th simply think in terms of building and walking away so i'm going to run through some of the chapter themes in the first part of the document first right up front we decided to deal with the whole question of stakeholder engagement uh, stakeholders are increasingly expecting earlier, broader and better engagement and NMBF provides a unique opportunities for that. It's particularly important in the case of NMBF because of the increased likelihood of multiple benefits and therefore multiple beneficiaries and I would say also potentially multiple funders of projects. It's important that it's done throughout the whole of the project uh, uh, cycle and each of the phases and needs a plan and resources to carry it out but the approach needs to reflect the type of engagement which could be anything from light touch through to extensive interaction and that depends on the nature of your stakeholders how much impact the project will have on them and how much influence they have on the future the next topic in this general part is systems thinking. Systems thinking is absolutely essential when it comes to NMBF, where we're trying to look at things in a holistic way. It's needed to reduce conflict and maximize synergies. It's important to also recognize that NMBF solutions develop over time and space and therefore you need to understand the system dynamics uh, both spatially and temporally and in order to achieve those multiple co-benefits co that we're looking for so you could think of systems thinking of as being trying to integrate a top-down and a bottom-up approach so are you going to think big and try and look at the whole system scale but you've also got to think about how individual projects work so you've got to think also start small and the other thing about systems thinking is the opportunity to create purposely redundant features um, that allows uh, additional resilience a major issue that the project team wrestled with was this whole idea of performance and metrics in order for people to take on board the idea of NMBF they've got to be convinced that they will deliver the performance that is needed 
and uh, that is critical alongside being confident that the associated co-benefits will also be delivered. The difficulty with NMBF is how you measure what's needed and you have to employ a mixture of direct and indirect measurements and also computational predictions but the important thing is to assess everything against predetermined performance criteria because there's a, an evolution in the performance of NMBF over a project life cycle you do need these periodic reassessments of performance to see that the growth in performance as indicated in the diagram on the right hand side is achieved. A big issue with I guess performance of everything that we create as flood risk managers is uncertainty in performance but the natural variability of NMBF um, may create greater um, uncertainty but then with adaptive management, which you'll come back to in a minute, you can manage that. But we also need more information. It's recognized on rates of failure and also maintenance costs. The actual evidence that's available to us on the effectiveness of measures depends on how well used uh, the particular measure has been in the past. Uh, things like beaches and dunes, for example, and wetlands are actually well established, whereas uh, things like seagrass and small scale fluvial slowing and storage measures are much uh, less, there's much less experience on those things. But the key questions are there for us to answer how much energy in the case of coastal measures does the NMBF absorb? And in the case of fluvial measures, how much space does the NMBF make for water? Then we come to uh, the chapter on evaluation of those co-benefits. The little diagram on the left hand side of this slide is quite useful because it shows uh, that you've got some kind of action, some kind of change some kind of change in ecosystem services and benefits. You're looking primarily as a flood risk manager on how much, for example, wave attenuation wetlands might generate and the resulting avoided flooding and da reduced damages. But then through the lens of co-benefits, we could also be thinking about the, cha the, uh, the change in the rate of fisheries production um, and the stock biomass and the consequential benefits. So the issue around co-benefits is that there's a wide range of approaches that can be used. You need to think about cost effectiveness and trade-offs. Um, obviously there's economic approaches and there's ecosystem services approaches and the metrics uh, that are available you know, are commensurate with those. And it depends really on who's involved as to which is the mo most appropriate approach to adopt for their evaluation. And finally, coming to adaptive management, um, which we've mentioned already several times, as we said, NMBF does involve processes of varying uncertainty. We want to deliver uh, through the cyclical process of adaptive management, which you see on the top right of this slide. Uh, you go through planning, designing, building, monitoring and um, evaluating and then go back through the cycle again. But go through by going through that cycle, you want to reduce uh, the what's called the cone of uncertainty with a diagram at the on the bottom of the slide as you move from left to right. And thereby improve uh, confidence um, in performance. The advantage of, asset, uh, of adaptive management is that it allows much more flexibility in project uh, design and allows you to manage unexpected and unintended outcomes and allows for appropriate timely action. 
So moving on then to the uh, different parts of the documents, which I'm going to have to cover fairly quickly because of time. So five minutes, first of all, on coastal NMBF. So they work by attenuating storing and stable, uh, storing uh, flood water, attenuating waves, storing flood water and stabilizing sediments. You need to think about the defense line and the environment and the change. And we have to decide where we want to put the defense line, where we want to keep it where it is or change it. So a range of measures available to us. Uh, beaches and dunes, established uh, approaches, inherently dynamic, but absorb wave energy and protect land from flooding and damage. Uh, it's essential to integrate the approaches of the engineering with the geomorphology and the ecology, and you need those multiple expertises, and you need to consider past and future processes. In the case of wetlands, um, wetlands and tidal flats have reduced both waves and water levels. They tend to be able to reduce wave heights within a narrower width than um, storm surge water levels, uh, which need a larger width in order for them to be um, reduced. We can draw on extensive experience in the restoration of marshes and mangroves. Um, we need to, and we can recognize that the potential for these measures to be self self-maintaining and even improving with time as vegetation establishes and develops. Reefs, of course, are, uh, we have a lot of engineering knowledge about the design of conventional uh, low crested submerged breakwaters to um, dissipate wave action. Coral and oyster reefs can provide a similar level of coastal protection and what we want to try to do here is to, and the advice is to mimic uh, the natural uh, geomorphology and, bio, and biology um, of the or biological environment for these features. Again, they can be self-sustaining, but they may require adaptive management. Um, submerged um, pardon. Um, submerged plant systems, um, they have a, a lot of potential to absorb waves, slow water movement and stabilize sediments um, and can provide those ecological benefits. It's critical not to try to put them in situations where they will likely result in failure. So that means you've got to pick the appropriate scale. Uh, that means uh, that in some situations it's a good idea to keep them as, uh, as small projects in low energy environments, but it may also mean that they could be part of a, a much bigger uh, portfolio approach in larger NMBF projects. And that leads me naturally to consider the final uh, group of NMBF measures for the coast, which is islands. Um, the advantage of islands is that they can provide um, multiple um, forms of flood risk reduction as well as multiple co-benefits, particularly in uh, er urban areas where they can be used as part of a multiple line of defense strategy. But they are such large features that they've got to be evaluated in the regional context. Um, they may have multi-habitat features, including the um, subaquatic vegetation, but in creating them, there are inevitable, inevitably habitat trade-offs because you're having to replace one type of habitat with another. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty and risk in the construction process, which we talk about. And we, ne we need to recognize the dynamic nature of islands and therefore the whole way that you assess their performance over time may well change. Moving on to fluvial NMBF, uh, the key principles here depend on where you are in the watershed. So in the upper and middle watershed, the, the, the main thing you're trying to achieve is to capture, retain and slow or disperse flood water. 
as well as improving connectivity and interaction of the watercourse with the floodplain and trying to preserve sediment balance. In the lower watershed, um, the measures are really all around increasing uh, or trying to improve the functionality of this, these lowland areas. And this often involves increasing discharge capacity in one way or another. That may be in a very engineering way by a strategic widening or dredging of existing channels, or it might be through the creation of additional conveyance channels. One of the things that NMBF give us the opportunity for is dealing with historic watershed problems. They don't uh, necessarily solve all those problems that can be faced, but we have a chapter addre addressing this issue and exploring the extent to which they can uh, address those issues. So we've got some examples here listed in this table. Uh, channel instability um, is something that an NMBF can definitely address. Alongside uh, flood risk reduction, um, they may also be able to assist in in um, improving water quality. And obviously, if they're uh, biologically based, then overcoming issues of loss of flora and fauna. But some complex interactions here, which we which we which we wrestle with in the guidance. And then we also deal with uh, the general approaches for NMBF in the fluvial environment and uh, build on the general principles that we've got at the beginning of the document, uh, particularly focusing on this idea of a whole watershed approach. Uh, nested approaches within the watershed and avoiding transferring risks downstream or to adjacent areas. Um, for example, the classic problem, um, hydrological problem of, of, synchronize, of synchronization, actually making the, yes. the synchronization between the, the main river and the tributary worse rather than better. And then the second item here, which is very analogous to a lot of the things which ASFPM has been talking about for years in terms of wise use of floodplains, levy setbacks, relocations of communities, land use zoning, uh, designated floodways and so on. As an enormous range of fluvial NMBF and one of the challenges the document faced was how to present those. So we decided to group them together in, in a series of five main groups um, and then tackle these uh, one by one briefly, talking about how they affect uh, how they work and the kind of benefits that they deliver. So the kind of structure that we've got in the main chapter which runs through this is these main groupings. Um, river and floodplain management, vegetation management, rural runoff management, urban runoff management and erosion management. And then um, for each of those, there is a, uh, a brief description of the particular measure, in this case on the right hand side of the slide, river restoration. And it explains which issues in the watershed the NMBF addresses and describes how they perform. And then this nice feature on the right hand side of the of the lower image here um, of a, uh, showing the the extent to which these different measures can have greater or lesser impact in terms of their additional co-benefits. Um, with these uh, wheel um, benefit wheel diagrams. Uh, and then there's a final ch uh, chapter in the fluvial section, which gives a series of case studies to try and explain how these principles and the individual measures have been implemented in practice uh, in a wide range of case studies from around the world. So you hear, see here examples from um, the Missouri in United States and from the Peak District in United Kingdom. 
One thing that I should mention before I close is a separate issue is, are there ways that we can in environmentally enhance conventional infrastructure? And the answer to that is yes. And um, there's some interesting opportunities emerging for doing that, yeah. creating hard features that encourage uh, environmental or ecological systems to actually grow and develop on those uh, hard structures. So here you see some examples on the right hand side of pools on uh, groins and the coast and uh, feature elements uh, being researched in the lower image, looking to see the extent to which algae and other um, features grow on hard structures. And they, they, the great, the principal benefit of these is that they provide um, or they can provide from the point of view of flood risk management additional benefit in terms of actually protecting uh, the conventional infrastructure from deterioration. So I have some con brief conclusions. NBF are not new. Um, they, they will function well. They work best in either nested systems in the fluvial environment or as portfolios in the coastal environment. Um, they almost always achieve multiple co-benefits and they be they're best set up where they complement rather than try to replace traditional engineering and they can be managed adaptively to take account of change. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, we have time for just a few questions. We've got a couple here in the box that we're going to ask of Jonathan. And the first one was, some people use NBS and green infrastructure concepts as interchangeable. What is the nuance of this approach um, slash term in the context of flood risk management? Jonathan? Okay, um, well, there are a lot of terms around, unfortunately, which have got overlapping definitions. Um, and I, I think it depends on the context as to which is, is, is most appropriate, really. I mean, the whole, the whole function of, sorry, something not quite going quite right here, but anyway, the, the, the point about natural and nature-based features is that uh, they are they have a specific meaning uh, in relation to flood risk management nature-based solutions green infrastructure those other terms don't necessarily relate to flood risk management uh, <laughs> there's a that's a, a small question with a very big answer i guess it depends on the nature of the fluvial nmbf the there is such a big range there. Some of them are very small scale measures and therefore often go ahead with very little uh, prior evaluation. It's very much, a, it's a very much do it and see what happens kind of approach. Others which operate at a much larger scale often have a lot of prior investigation and therefore there's greater confidence in what the long-term performance is likely to be. Thank you. Good day to you, wherever you are. Uh, I'm sorry that we cannot be doing this presentation in person. I would love to meet you all. Uh, in the meantime, we will have to do it this way, and I hope that this is informative for you. I'm Pat Forbes. I'm with the Louisiana Office of Community Development. Uh, and I'm here today to talk to you about the Louisiana Watershed Initiative, which is an initiative uh, to reduce flood risk in the state of Louisiana. A uh, few different pieces to the presentation. First, what is the Watershed Initiative? Uh, second, some of the program approaches that the initiative takes. Uh, essentially, how do we hope to accomplish what we hope to accomplish? What are the pieces of the program? And then, of course, we will have time for your questions. So first, what is the Louisiana Watershed Initiative? <clears throat> In 2018, Governor John Bell Edwards launched the Watershed Initiative uh, for the primary purposes of reducing flood risk, improving floodplain management across the state 
in maximizing the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains. He did this with an executive order, uh, although he had charged the uh, members of the council with this work some two years before, immediately following the devastating floods that we experienced in the summer of 2016 from rainfall. Uh, so essentially, uh, we were started, the watershed initiative was started uh, in response to those floods and to uh, make sure that we do a better job in the future of reducing flood risk for our citizens. First, if we're going to understand watershed-based floodplain management, we have to know what a watershed is. A uh, watershed or drainage basin is an area of land that drains to a common point. You could go to any stream or lake uh, and all the area that drains to that point is the watershed for that point. And of course, large watersheds contain other smaller watersheds that are small drainage features, uh, uh, big rivers that have multiple watersheds that feed them. Um, and so managing the water as it flows is the heart of watershed-based floodplain management. We've adopted some guiding principles for the watershed initiative. First and foremost, data, science, and engineering are going to drive the process. Uh, secondly, transparent objective decision making. Well, that's only possible when you have those data engineering and science tools and approaches available to you, but also when you uh, perform your work in open meetings and make sure that the folks for whom you are working are engaged to the maximum extent possible. Third is maximizing natural function of floodplains. The, the, the more we look at um, flood risk reduction and management and floodplain management, the better we understand that it is impossible for us to have a resilient, reduced flood risk future without maximizing the natural functions of floodplains. Um, essentially, uh, separating the streams from their floodplains, the things that we have done in the past uh, can only make us less resilient in the future. And lastly, uh, but certainly not least, regional water management. And what that means is regions that are based on watershed delineation rather than uh, the standard jurisdictions, parishes, counties, cities, towns. Um, so make, having the decision-making done on a regional basis that is defined by watersheds uh, is absolutely critical. The strategic areas of focus for us, I've already spoken about data. You can't do this without having data engineering, um, science to give people something to coalesce around that is a common set of facts. Uh, standards, at the same time, you have to have a common set of standards. You can't have uh, jurisdictions within a, a watershed uh, having competing approaches to floodplain management. It's a recipe for disaster as we've learned over the years. Engagement, if we're going to do this well, people have to understand the need for this shift in approach. And you can't do that without meeting people where they are, helping them understand the advantages and in the end, getting the buy-in from all the folks who will benefit from this ultimately. Planning, of course, if we're going to have data and tools available to us, if we're going to uh, engage with people and get them to adopt standards, uh, it's gonna require planning. And so that's at the heart of the process. Capability and capacity. One thing that became very clear to us was that 
smaller, maybe less affluent jurisdictions could very well be left out of this process due to a lack of capacity and capability within their jurisdiction. Just not having the wherewithal to engage in the process. We know that this process can't be successful if we if we allow that to happen. So we are also focused on um, ensuring that folks have the tools and the skill sets available to them, whether they have the funds to pay for that or not, to engage in the process. And then funding. We will talk in a second about uh, one funding source, but the key to the long term success of this is not only identifying other funding sources, but harnessing funding sources that already exist. Um, the first, uh, the, the executive order that the governor put out in 2018, what it did was create the Council on Watershed Management that consists of these five agencies in the state of Louisiana, the Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority, the Governor's Office of Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness, the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Department of Transportation and Development, and the Office of Community Development. Uh, his purpose was to not exclude other agencies, but to make sure that the agencies had the most um, activities in this field would be at at the table and in this conversation from the very beginning, there's every intention that this will continue to expand. Uh, but it's interesting, one of the things the governor said was in response to folks saying, why don't you just distribute funds uh, based on damages or population of the various jurisdictions, what have you. And what he acknowledged right off the bat was it's harder to do it this way. It requires more work. It's more politically risky, but it's the right thing to do. It's, in essence, what he told us was, um, whatever we've been doing in the past, it is does not appear to be working. We gotta, we've gotta figure out a different way. So, the Watershed Initiative uh, has the Council on Watershed Management at the middle of essentially overseeing the, the work of the various different pieces of the effort. We have technical advisory groups in different arenas. Uh, those consist primarily of state and federal agency personnel. Uh, then of course, if we're going to have this regional process, we've got to have people with the, who are enabled and empowered to make decisions at the local level. So we have created regional steering committees for each of uh, eight different regions around the state so that citizens from that watershed, <clears throat> excuse me, from that watershed region can get together and make their own decisions about uh, how to manage their blood risk. Um, the technical advisory groups, their primary work is to uh, get together and discuss issues in their arena, but also to bring in perspectives from others around the state and the country to make sure that all the best information gets to the Council on Watershed Management so they can make their uh, best decisions. Program approaches. Uh, first, regional capacity building grant program. We have uh, initially divided the state up into eight different watershed regions. Each one has a coordinator. That is an entity that can hire um, staff to ensure that every entity, every uh, jurisdiction within that region has uh, qualified staff that they can call on to help them as they go through this process and engage with this process. Um, you can see on the slide here the various different, e each region was told to decide who their watershed coordinating entity might be. We have planning commissions, we have police juries, which are our parish or county governments uh, there. 
and each one uh, chose what worked best for them. And uh, we are now working with these steering committees uh, going forward. Next is the CDBG Mitigation Action Plan. The state of Louisiana was awarded $1.2 billion from, by Congress uh, for mitigation of future risks after the 2016 floods. So we have submitted and had approved an action plan. Uh, that action plan includes these focus areas for spending. One is modeling. Uh, we got to make sure we've got good data. We got to use those data to help us understand the impacts of specific flood streams. And we have to make those data and those models available so people can use them to make good decisions. Then there's flood risk reduction projects, of course, this is where the majority of the money will be spent. That's in things like getting people out of harm's way, uh, improving retention and slowing down uh, the speed with which water gets to our, our uh, drainage system so that we can reduce overall flood elevations and flood risk. And then of course, regional programs. For the long term, for this to work, it has to uh, be managed at the watershed level. And so at the same time, we are uh, spending great effort to ensure that these regional coordinating entities are stood up and functioning at the local level. Okay, I'm going to say a little bit more about the watershed modeling effort. You can see that we've uh, divided the state up into seven different modeling regions. Uh, each one has its own firm that is doing the modeling. Those firms have been procured and they will be producing models at the HUC 8 scale over the next uh, 18 months to two years. In addition, uh, while we can have the best models in the world, if we don't have good data going into those models, they won't be worth anything. And we recognized also that we have a terrible shortage of rain and river gauges in the state. So we're also enhancing our gauge network across the state. Uh, using essentially crowdsourcing to identify the places that are in most need of additional uh, rain and river gauges to help make sure that our models can be as useful as possible to not only the state but the local watershed regions that are using them to make their own decisions. Of course, when you're dealing with streams and rivers and flooding, it is absolutely critical to coordinate with federal agencies, particularly for us, FEMA, Corps of Engineers, and U.S. Geologic Survey. Uh, USGS is helping us build out the gauge networks, managing the installation and data collection for us. Corps of Engineers has tons of data already available models that they've done around the state and of course expertise in modeling and data collection. And then uh, FEMA uh, with their uh, flood insurance rate maps, we wanna make sure that our models are as valuable as possible for every purpose, including uh, enhancing those and making them more informative in the future. And of course FEMA brings expertise to the conversation as well. Next is uh, round one, as we call it. It's a $100 million grant program. We recognize that we don't have uh, adequate data and modeling around the state right now. So uh, what we wanted to do, what we thought was imperative, what the governor told us we had to do was get some projects funded now. We have to start investing in flood risk reduction. We have to, uh, people have to see 
that there are in fact things occurring uh, with, with these funds to reduce risk. And so we've got the uh, around one local and regional program essentially to imp implement low risk, high impact projects. And that is to say projects that have an extremely low risk of increasing flooding for neighboring jurisdictions or areas. It's a hundred million dollar uh, grant round, as I said, and uh, that is divided up in a couple of different ways. 60 million will be selected by SCORE alone, and then uh, the remaining 40 million will be selected at the regional level, 5 million per region uh, for whatever projects they uh, believe to be the highest priority. Then there's statewide watershed plan development. Of course, uh, it's critical that we have uh, watershed regional plans, but we've also got to have a statewide plan. And our vision for uh, when we ultimately get the watershed initiative implemented is to be a model of resilience for the nation, uh, that we have done this in a way that we've created a model for folks to look at and learn from and say, hey, that's how we can do this better. Essentially, our job is to create the blueprint for achieving the vision. And that's not just for us, it's not just for state agencies, it's for everybody in the state to recognize the value and consequently work towards the vision. Um, inform, educate, and engage. This is a new approach to things. Uh, people need to understand it, including us, better than we do right now to be able to make sure that it's successful. And then we've got to adapt and evolve as we go. We will all be learning as we go. So now I uh, can open it up to questions from the group. Uh, happy to take as many as uh, you have. Hopefully I can answer them. Hello, this is Karen Sands, and I work at the Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District, which I'll either call MMSD or the district, probably throughout my talk, sort of interchangeably. We work to protect public health and the drinking water supply for millions. Um, but first, um, just a little fifth grade geography review. This is Wisconsin. Um, my uh, agency is in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, that's in the southeastern portion of the state, about 90 miles north of Chicago. We're also really fortunate to be on the western shores of Lake Michigan. And so in being there, we have access to about 20% of the world's available fresh water. So in a land of um, not enough water often, um, we are in the land of plenty and then some. Lake Michigan has many moods, and some of those are more brooding than others. Um, regardless of the mood, though, she's always a thing of beauty to me. The lake looks more like an ocean than um, a lake, and it's the receiving water body that we work very hard to protect at MMSD. Our area waterways flow into this lake, which is also our drinking water supply. So MMSD, where I work, is a regional government agency, and we treat wastewater that 28 different municipalities send to us um, that are in six watersheds in the Milwaukee area. So this map that you're looking at doesn't show the municipalities because that would make it way too busy, um, but it focuses on the watersheds. And when it was, isn't raining, these watersheds that you see here um, send about 130 million gallons of water to be cleaned each and every day. And when it is raining, that can be much, much more. We also perform flood management projects for out of bank flooding, and we design green infrastructure projects, and we purchase land um, to deal with localized and uh, upstream drainage issues that cause downstream flooding. So we have jurisdiction over about 130 miles of waterways. Um, and what I'm gonna focus on today are the three watersheds you'll see um, like in salmon um, and then blue and then green. And those three watersheds are really sub-watersheds of the Milwaukee River watershed. 
forgive me, I'm not an artist, but um, this is a diagram of water's pathways uh, that you may all know in some way, shape, or form. This is meant to represent water falling from the sky in an urban environment like Milwaukee's. Um, the water can fall in open space, it can fall on pavement, and it can fall on buildings. Those are the three choices I see anyway. Then it gets even more complex. And if you're trying to remediate excess water, there are a lot of pathways you need to be looking at in between. It can go into groundwater. Rainwater can go into sewers, both storm sewers, sanitary sewers, and combined storm and sanitary. And then it can also end up in area waterways, and there's interchange between those paths as well. And then ultimately, if you're in Milwaukee or this region, it goes that water goes to either one, or, one of two water reclamation facilities or directly into Lake Michigan, ultimately. At MMSD, we tend to work in all of these spaces with the exception of groundwater. And so you can imagine that the interconnections and the different um, interventions that we have to have would take many different paths. So let's start with flooding. Um, Out-of-bank flooding impacts our wastewater operations and also obviously impacts the city of Milwaukee and many of the other 27 municipalities around us. It can enter buildings, get into floor drains, um, get into uh, sanitary sewers, and it ends up as something we have to treat um, that um, really we would prefer not to when we have really big rainstorms. Um, and our we also have a collection system that collects the uh, wastewater and combined waste and stormwater from the 28 municipalities. And our collection system runs underground along many of the area waterways. And so when we have out-of-bank flooding situations, that water can also just be pouring into our system. So it's in our best interest to try to remediate scenes like this. Um, in the 1960s in the Milwaukee area and 50s and you know um, beyond, as across other parts of the country, a drainage approach was taken to the competing interests of urban development and hardscaping versus natural um, flow paths of water. So um, our previous engineers smoothed and straightened area waterways. And in the olden days, our streams really were designed kind of like open sewers instead of community assets. That's not where I'm going here with this presentation, though. Um, just a little background, too. We have had a lot of extreme events. Um, for example, several, a couple in the late 90s that really catalyzed our flood management programs. And um, we used to call them 100 year storms. And now they're 1% probability events because um, the probability is actually, or the um, frequency is much more frequent than every 100 years, um, which I think we're also seeing across the country when we have too much water. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how different projects can work together as part of a holistic solution. The Menominee River is one of the sub-watersheds of the Milwaukee River watershed. We tend to refer to it as a watershed, so if you hear me say that, so that's why. Um, we have flooding along the Menominee River, and that um, spans many municipalities, and that requires a system approach. Um, this map shows the floodplain in light blue where we have a system of projects, mostly that have all been constructed um, with a number of techniques. Moving from left to right, the Milwaukee County Grounds Project is an offline flood management basin that takes water off of Underwood Creek, um, a tributary of the Menominee, and temporarily stores it in county grounds. In the middle, we have um, levees, a system of levees in Hart Park, um, and we have also had some uh, um, residential and uh, limited business acquisitions as well to um, triple the size of the park and give the river back much of its floodplain. And then in western Milwaukee there were also um, a series of buyouts. Our buyouts tend to be voluntary and some flood proofing as well. And this, these are all voluntary. Um, we um, pay fair market value as if the structures were not in a floodplain. Looking at a different sub watershed of the Milwaukee River watershed, um, Lincoln Creek is a tributary to the Milwaukee River. It had been straightened um, and concreted. This particular project didn't have a lot of area to give the river 
um, back more of its bed and banks um, and floodplain. Um, it's very, very densely developed. And because it was one of our earlier projects, we didn't have any data that um, we could point to and say, removing structures, by removing structures, you'll actually have an area where property values will increase. And so you're not losing tax base permanently, you're enhancing the tax base that um, you're allowing to remain. But through this project and a few others like it, we now know that it's important um, to give the project as much space as it needs in order to um, ensure the livelihoods and well-being of people around and also to provide all kinds of habitat features and values. So a couple of slides ago I showed you three areas with um, along the Milwaukee River, I'm sorry, the Menominee River, um, and the first one on the far left is Milwaukee County Grounds Flood Storage Basins. Um, the area that you're seeing on the left hand side of this slide, um, you know, it was derelict, there were some community gardens, some people would walk their dogs. Um, there were also um, cemeteries, and there's a whole other story behind that, um, and inappropriate um, burials. Um, and then after, this really became a community asset. Um, very rarely does it take on water. It's very much a place of beauty. Um, it's a place where people go to hike and walk their dogs um, now in a um, much more naturalistic environment in a sort of um, natural oasis um, within the dense um, urban area. Another example of flood management work that we've done is on, along Underwood Creek. This is um, the tributary that um, does um, flow into Milwaukee County grounds when we have really high flows in that waterway. Um, the concrete lining was removed, the, con the channel itself was given more natural meanders, and um, this is a picture right after construction, but it's really quite an incredible thing of beauty to see now. And then in the KK River watershed, um, this is a highly impervious area. It's about 45% impervious, um, almost twice as much as the other watersheds I've showed you. And um, you probably remember that anything that's 10% or more impervious is considered an impaired watershed. So at 45% impervious, this is a very difficult and flashy watershed. So again, here, typical story, in the 1960s, the channel was lined with concrete. It, they, it probably, this probably looked like a great engineering feat at the time, and now we kind of bristle. It had a, it had over six miles of streams that were lined with concrete and we're gradually removing that concrete for a number of important reasons. Of course, public safety. Um, these are, on the left, that's an extreme flood event. That's one of the events um, from the um, early to mid 2000s, but it was a very high um, frequency or low frequency storm, high, um, high rainfall event. And these people are on a bridge where it's really not safe for them to be on, as you can see. And then in, in other cases, in the bottom right here, um, it, this isn't a place where uh, a person should be taking two little kids to play. People have fallen in this river, particularly when it's um, flowing high. There's no easy way to get out of it, um, so it's just a dangerous place to live and play. Currently, um, the concrete lining is um, beyond its useful life. So this is a good time for us to talk about naturalizing. Um, it's also a good time for us to talk about recreational opportunities on the KK. People tend to take what they can from an environment. And you, you can see that there's probably some demand for a path here, but these are not the kinds of paths that we want people to feel safe on and use. This is just um, a little back and forth on the floodplain. So um, this shows the Kinnickinnick River flowing um, mostly from south and west to east and north into uh, Lake Michigan. And where you see the waterway flaring out a little bit, that's the floodplain, the 1% probability floodplain, as it was um, from the 80s into the 90s. I'm gonna flip forward here. We've done some um, additional uh, modeling work with a regional planning agency. And as you can see, that floodplain has expanded tremendously and kind of flashing back and forth. Um, so right now, um, there's a huge, not only opportunity, but also need to take care of flood flows in the KK River watershed. 
Um, with this new modeling effort, over 600 properties were added to the 100-year floodplain, meaning there's a lot, whole lot of work to be done to get people out of harm's way. So a watershed plan was put together with solutions throughout the watershed to um, have uh, voluntary acquisitions where need be, to provide um, several basins, um, and to just generally do what has to be done, not only to attenuate the flood flows and hold them back during big storms, but then also to be mindful of community needs, um, the importance of green space in urban areas, and to also um, make sure that we consider equity in our projects. So at the top of this, when I say how will we handle the other 1.6%, what I mean by that is MMSD is able to take the wastewater from our 28 municipalities and treat 98.4% of it, meaning almost all of it. But there's a little bit left when it rains really, really hard um, that we can't handle. So we have plans in place to expand our gray infrastructure, but potentially or most importantly where there are undersized capacity issues, but then to continue to add green infrastructure to the surface of the land. So switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about green infrastructure. Um, show a couple of pictures here. The top one is Bradford Beach on the, the uh, Lake Michigan, where we helped install bioswales um, bio to attenuate flows from the bluff off to the left that you can't see. And then the picture um, on the bottom is our green grid tray system on our headquarters roof, just as examples. Um, but it's important that we look at ways that we not only handle out of bank flooding, but the type of flooding that happens further up in the watershed before that water even gets into area waterways. So to more holistically consider green infrastructure, we put together a, a plan for the region. In that plan, we have 48 recommendations that are pretty major that fall into five buckets or categories. We wanna make sure that we fund projects we expand collaboration, we develop programs, we standardize requirements, and then we learn, share, and adapt. That's sort of the educational um, bucket. Uh, just a funny aside about the guy on the right, he is an IT professional who works for MMSD, and we had a promotion for about uh, once a month, he would, we would dress him up thematically and um, put him in a social media post, um, encouraging the use of rain barrels. Um, he's, quite a good person to put up with that. So some of the programs that we fund, um, the first one for our green infrastructure partnership program, we put about $3 million a year into co-funding projects. We don't fund the whole project outright. We don't build it ourselves, but we do make awards to worthy projects. We also have a green solutions program where we give money to our 20 municipalities based on their equalized value um, so that they can build green infrastructure. We this year have a new program called Community-Based Green Infrastructure, which is a public-private partnership with Corvius, um, and they are providing about $20 million worth of green infrastructure on a very fast-tracked um, partnership approach. And then finally, outreach. That's very small, much smaller scale. Um, roll up your sleeves, talk to neighborhoods or neighbors about things that they can do on a small scale on residential properties. You can imagine COVID-19 has um, put a wrench in some of our outreach activities, but we're figuring out how to have more of an online presence and then also how to go into the field um, while maintaining CDC recommended practices for social or physical distancing. Um, um, then I wanted to go further up into the watersheds, all the way up into the Milwaukee River watershed, and talk about three of our programs in which um, we are helping to um, hold water where it falls. So the first program is our Green Seams program. It was, we bill it as part of our um, flood management work, and what we have done is we've looked at where there are hydric soils that are on um, parcels or assemblages that can be at least 24 acres or greater <clears throat> that provide additional value and are part of a community's or an NGO's open space plan. So we've identified those lands. We have a goal to acquire 10,000 acres of those lands by 2035. Um, 
We restore the properties when we can. Um, and none of this is a small thing. Talk a little bit about that in a minute. So there are many benefits of our green seams program. And the first one I always lead with is reduced um, future flooding risk. Um, that's super important to us. Uh, the having green seams um, program in place with lands protected upstream helps to make sure that additional impervious cover um, isn't added um, at a, an extreme rate that would overtop our um, freeboard on our flood management projects that are downstream. It also provides um, benefits to this generation and it, I think it's forward thinking for the next generation. We see it as cost effective flood management, even though it's not in the urban environment, um, it is all connected to the watershed. Um, we have seen improved water quality benefits. It's um, huge for open space preservation. There are quality of life improvements. Um, we allow people to use our lands um, for packed, passive use recreation. And then again, when we can, we restore and protect wildlife habitat. Um, partnerships in doing this are absolutely crucial. And I just wanted to show you this because um, we have so many partners involved. Um, and partners will do things not only like fun, but they'll also help with acquisitions, they'll help with restoration. Some of it's very hands-on, some of it's very top-down. All of this um, in these groups working together are important for the success of our Green Seams program. So to date, we have purchased and protected over 100 properties. We don't always end up owning the properties. Uh, sometimes we will um, deed them over to a land trust, but we make sure that we retain a conservation easement on them when we do that. We've preserved almost 4,000 acres. Um, we've leveraged um, over $10 million in additional money for these acquisitions from other funders. Um, we've restored um, a great deal of the acreage and we've planted over 100,000 trees. Um, so, let's see. Okay, so, um, and we put um, properties together in green seams assemblages um, through a number of programs. So we look at public and open space parcels, and those are shown in blue on this diagram. Those are already protected. Um, we then identify green seams um, properties and corridors, and I mentioned a little bit about that with the hydric soils. And then we have another program that's newer called Working Soils Priority Corridors. And together we try to protect as much contiguous land as possible. So a little bit about working soils. Oops. Um, in the middle of the map, if you look at the part shown in yellow, and most of the map is green, the yellow is the MMSD planning area. The green is the rest of the Milwaukee River watershed that's outside of our waterway or outside of our jurisdiction. And so the red arrow is just a surrogate for the water course and the direction of flow. But everything that happens in the upstream area ends up in MMSD's um, planning area um, and into Lake Michigan eventually. So there's a lot of ground to cover upstream. Um, and so you can say this, this watershed is heavily um, rural um, and uh, farmland, and then the downstream end is very, very dense and impervious. So the Working Soils program, which I mentioned is newer, um, has a number of accomplishments that I just want to quick go through as well. There have been three farmer peer groups that have been established to share um, success stories about um, management of runoff and um, farm fields. There has been a demonstration farm network that was formed. Over 650 acres um, of easements, over 3,000 acres of agricultural best management practices installed, um, 3,000 3, feet of grassed waterways, and we've leveraged over $4 million. And that's an old figure because just a few weeks ago we learned that we were granted another $7.5 million. Um, and that came with an additional um, leverage from partners. So the type, the, 
Um, working together in a watershed planning, of course, is required. Building capacity among watershed partners, especially those not used to working together or used to working with a sewerage district, is highly important. Um, educating, engaging, activating, making sure that leaders are involved along the way is super important. And then a roadmap. Pick a path and then just go. Um, we can study things to death here at MMSD if we let ourselves. But we also know the right thing to do. And so it's important um, that while we're planning, um, we're also doing. And that's been our model. So with that, um, we do work on out-of-bank flooding. Um, that's important. Moving further up into our uh, service area, we work on a lot of green, green infrastructure projects. And then further up into the upper watershed, um, we have our green seams and working soils programs. Those working together in conjunction with one another um, have overlaps, of course, but they also have tremendous benefits. And um, it's kind of empowering talking about how they all fit together because I don't think we could really pull one piece out of it and, and say that the watershed will ultimately work in terms of flow and um, pollutant load reduction. Um, but we are there, or we I think we have the roadmap to doing so. And um, that's all I have. Please let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>